a lot of fun people there. You know, farmers. They're just a blast. <laughs> they really know how to tell jokes. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is what I did when I was in the service, or when I was working in medicine. Uh, 12 years in the service and then 18 years uh, as a civilian. Uh, the adrenal glands look like lumps of fat that sit on top of the dark, highly vascularized kidneys. Uh, your kidneys are extremely important. Uh, if you don't believe it, then uh, uh, you need to read about dialysis because if your kidneys don't work on their own, then you need to do dialysis. Of course, people with diabetes, uh, sometimes their kidneys will shut down and they need to do dialysis. So one of my jobs was uh, measuring people's urinary or kidney functions. Uh, the, the adrenal glands are specialized to react to periods of high stress. That's what they're for. Like I said, they look, they literally look like lumps of fat. Uh, if you uh, do an autopsy, which none of you can do because you're Navajo, but if, uh, if you're not Navajo and you're doing an autopsy and you cut into that portion of the body, of course, you have to take all the organs out. One of the things you will do is measure the kidneys and to try to determine if they have uh, any kind of kidney problems. Uh, you have two uh, structures in your, in your body that uh, clean out uh, uh, toxins, poisons. Uh, one of them is your liver and the other is your kidneys. So your kidneys uh, have to be functioning properly or you'll have a buildup of toxins. And of course that will make you very, 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 very sick. Uh, once upon a time when I was younger, uh, I was running in a track meet and my kidneys shut down. And by the end of the track meet, I couldn't run anymore because I had had such a high buildup of toxins that I was vomiting, as much fun as vomiting is. Uh, the outer layer or cortex uh, produced gonadic, uh, gonadic cor cor gonadocorticoids uh, like male androgens and female estrogens. That's what the uh, gonadocorticoids are. Uh, glucocorticoids like cortisol are produced by the adrenal glands, the outside of the uh, uh, adrenal glands. Uh, mineral corticoids like aldosterone that help regulate your blood pressure also come from the uh, uh, adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla is the inner layer. It produces hormones that serve uh, to get the body ready immediately for fight or flight. Uh, the two uh, hormones that it produces are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, they increase your heart rate, they increase your blood pressure, and they increase glucose providing uh, instant energy. So if you feel like you're about to, to get in a fight, a lot of times you, you, you start shaking because you've got all this energy and you're ready to, to strike out at somebody. And that's because of all this glucose that's surging through your system. Uh, the thyroid gland is shaped like a butterfly with uh, the two wings on the opposite sides of the windpipe. The thyroid produces uh, thyroxin, which regulates the body's growth and metabolism. Uh, you maintain about uh, 100 days worth of, uh, of thyroxin in your system. So if uh, your thyroid, uh, something happens to your thyroid or uh, if, it, uh, if it stops functioning, uh, for, for 100 days you're not going to know it. You're not going to know it until, until the supply of thyroxin depletes itself. Uh, at the back of the thyroid glands are four parathyroid glands. Uh, the parathyroid glands regulate calcium in the body to help maintain the nervous and muscular systems. Uh, if you understand how uh, nerves, uh, neurons work, of course, they, are all, they all have, uh, they function on uh, calcium. Uh, it's one of the substances that uh, regulates your neurons. You have sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, and uh, calcium. So if you don't have, and magnesium, actually. Uh, so if you don't have uh, enough calcium, uh, then your, your body will not function properly. Uh, Overreacting parathyroid glands can maintain too much calcium in the blood, uh, leading to kidney stones. Uh, this is uh, one of the only ways that a uh, uh, ovulating female can have kidney stones is if her parathyroid glands aren't working properly. Uh, an underactive uh, parathyroid gland can cause osteoporosis. You don't have enough calcium in your system. Uh, 
American Indians tend not to have problems with osteoporosis. Uh, the lighter complexioned you are, uh, the more likely you are to have problems with osteoporosis. Uh, the uh, two racial groups that have the most problems with osteoporosis are Asians and uh, Europeans. The white, pe white people and yellow people. Uh, uh, white people and Asians. <clears throat> so you see a lot of uh, individuals with uh, osteoporosis in Korea and Japan. Uh, they don't take in a lot of calcium. So, so a lot of times they have a problem with it. Um, I have seen people on the reservation with osteoporosis, but uh, not very many, not, not like what you see in other places. Now uh, here's the interesting thing, if you have an underactive parathyroid gland and you're a kid and you have an uh, underactive parathyroid gland, uh, you have a problem focusing and you, have a, uh, you tend to be depressed. Now what does that sound like? Depression and uh, problem focusing. What do you think we're going to diagnose this kid with? If they can't focus and they're depressed. ADHD. Yeah, ADHD. So this can be a problem. Uh, if, you're, if you go in to see the doctor, if you've got a kid that has, uh, is depressed and they have a problem focusing, uh, then they're going to diagnose them almost instantaneously. Everybody's going to diagnose them, including you, uh, with ADHD. But the reality is we need to check their thyroid gland, their, their parathyroid gland, to find out if they have uh, calcium prob problems with calcium. So despite the fact that it looks like a mental illness, it may be a physical illness. And that's one of the reasons why we're teaching this class. There's a lot of problems that are caused by um, uh, hormonal endocrine problems that look like mental problems. Hypoglycemia, for example, also looks like depression. Uh, erratic behavior, schizophrenia, uh, and that's hypoglycemia. So there's a lot of things. If your doctor is just diagnosing you without sending, without drawing any blood to find out if that's really your problem, then they're not, they're not doing it correctly. They need to make sure it's not a, a medical problem rather than a, a mental health problem. They start treating you. You can imagine if we start treating this kid with ADHD or as if they have ADHD, we're going to give them Ritalin. And if we give them Ritalin and they've got a parathyroid problem, they're not going to get any better. It's not going to fix them, even though we're giving them Ritalin. So a good doctor will draw blood from the kid to find out if they have a parathyroid problem or if they, have, if they actually have ADHD. Uh, the pancreas regulates sugar in the, in the uh, bloodstream by producing insulin to convert sugar from the, their diet into energy. The pancreas also produces glucagon to increase the amount of sugar in the bloodstream. And of course, that is your pancreas. Your heart's kind of cool. It weighs about 11 ounces. It's about the size of your fist. I mean, it's not very big. It's, this little guy is not very big. It pumps five quarts of blood a minute through the circulatory system. It will beat as much as 2.5 billion times in a lifetime. This is one of the reasons why you try to lower your blood pressure. Let me see what my, my, lower your blood pressure or lower your pulse. Oh, geez, my pulse is 115 right now. If I only have 2.5 billion times, uh, I'm wasting 115. I should just sit down and not do anything. <laughs> the heart is a major transportation system delivery, delivering nutrients uh, to and pulling waste products out of your body. This is where all the good stuff go comes in, the oxygen and the nutrients and it pulls out all the carbon dioxide and any toxins that happen to be in your system. We need to pull these things out. And of course we do that by filtering it through the kidneys, filtering the blood through the kidneys. We also filter the blood through the liver, but the liver only takes out uh, major toxins like alcohol or drugs. Uh, the kidneys will take out all the carbon dioxide, it will take out all, well, the carbon dioxide actually comes out in the lungs, it will take out any of the negative substances. And this is one of the reasons why if you have a problem with, what do you have a problem with? Drinking 
What are we taking? We have a problem with um, uh, if your kidneys have a problem and your your produce your body is producing toxins, it will it will pull it out of the kidneys. And this is one of the reasons why we why you have your urine checked every time you go in to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, and they will they will look at your kidneys to make sure you have proper kidney functions because one of the things that can happen everybody knows she's pregnant, right? No. I I thought everybody knew you were pregnant. No. I'm sorry. That's okay. fine. That's all right. Okay. Well, congratulations. <laughs> uh, this is one of the reasons why we have to we have to make sure your kidneys are still functioning. Okay, and make sure that you have no problems with your liver. Uh, because if you start having kidney problems, then that could that could affect the the, the baby. Uh, blood is living tissue and contains three types of cells. Uh, one of the types of cells is red cells. Uh, another word for uh, red cells are erythrocytes. Erythrocytes just means red cells. Um, red cells transport oxygen and other nutrients, and the waste products, especially carbon dioxide, away uh, from the uh, from the tissue. Uh, so it pulls out the carbon dioxide and it, it supplies nutrients and oxygen. All this transporting is accomplished by the iron uh, hemoglobin. And of course, this is what red cells look like. Uh, I worked with uh, blood for, an ex for 30 years. And I looked in a microscope almost thousands of times, hundreds of times a day. And this is what I was looking at. I was looking at the shapes uh, and the sizes of the red cells to make sure that they were okay. Uh, the second type of cell uh, in the blood are white, known as white cells or leukocytes. Leukocyte just means white cells. Leukocytes are part of the immune system and patrol throughout the body looking for problems. Uh, the neutrophils, these pink ones right here, uh, they are seeking out bacteria. Uh, the lymphocytes, these pur this purple and, and blue one, uh, is looking for viruses. Uh, eosinophils is looking for uh, in, uh, allergens, um, also parasites. So if you have a parasite, you'll have an excess number of, of uh, eosinophils. They're orange, it's really kind of cool. I mean, you, you look in somebody's blood and you got all these red cells, you got lots of these, you got lots of these guys, and it's almost a treat to see people with eosinophils because they're orange, it's a different color. Uh, eosinophils, uh, basophils are, are dark. Uh, as you can see, they've got uh, dark granules. Uh, they're looking for toxins or other heavy metals. Uh, and monocytes are looking for cancer. And they, they look like this. Actually, these two cells look a lot alike. Uh, so they're, they're kind of difficult to tell that, uh, that you have different types of leukocytes. Uh, the third type of cell in your body, uh, in your blood, are, are platelets or thrombocytes. Platelets are cytoplasmic remnants that circulate in the blood. Uh, to form clots uh, when there is a break in the circulatory system from a wound. So if somebody was smoking cigarettes, cigarettes uh, are vasoconstrictors, but they also make your platelets sticky. And so they make it more likely that you'll have a blood clot. This can be a really serious problem, blood clots. Because if it gets into your brain, of course, now you've got a stroke. Now you've had a stroke if you've got a blood clot. <clears throat> About 70% of all Strokes are caused by blood clots. As interesting as that is, 70% are caused by blood clots. Why is that interesting? Oh, because we have a medication that we can treat you with. So if you have a blood clot in your brain, we can give you this medication and it will dissolve the clot. Now that's kind of exciting. Because we can save your life if, you've had a, if you have a stroke from a blood clot. And 70% of the time, we're going to save your life. Now, the problem is that if we give you this stuff, <laughs> and you don't have a blood clot, you're going to bleed to death. And uh, we'll kill you instead of save your life, which is kind of exciting in itself. What is the name of that medication? TMC. Wait a minute. It's, that was TMZ. That's the television show. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, kind of cool stuff. Uh, so when I had my heart attack, uh, they gave me that stuff. Yeah, it didn't kill me. I guess he doesn't like you. I guess so. 
When the heart beats, it is moving blood throughout the system by opening and closing chambers of the heart, as much fun as this is. Unoxygenated blood will move into the right atrium uh, through the superior and inferior vena cava. Uh, your atriums are the ones on top, and your ventricles are, are the ones on the bottom. Now, the atriums are really kind of cool because atrium just means uh, a holding place, and that's exactly what the atriums do. So the blood will come into one of the chambers of the heart, and then it will dump itself into the ventricle. Now, the ventricle is the muscular portion. You can see all the muscles in the, in the ventricle. And the ventricles are the ones that really pump the blood through your body. The atriums are just holding areas. So the first thing that happens is it drops into the right atrium. Uh, it's unoxygenated blood. In other words, it doesn't have any, any oxygen in it. Uh, it's really dark maroon. It's purple. It's well, it's the color of your of your uh, your sweat. And your, not, yeah, that thing right there. Vest. It's a vest. That's what it is. It's that literally that color. It's that dark. Your blood is that that color. As long as it doesn't have any oxygen in it. As soon as it, it uh, becomes oxygenated, it becomes as red as that that folder of. And that's what oxygenated blood. Now, it's really kind of interesting if somebody gets shot and they're bleeding out and the blood's coming, if they're, they're not hit in, a, in an artery, but they're hit in a, in a vein, they'll bleed out that color. And then as it sits there for a, a couple of minutes, it'll turn that color because all of a sudden there's oxygen in the air and it will become oxygenated. I know. So uh, the blood flows through that... Uh Right, the bottom ventricle first? No, it comes into the atrium first. It comes into the right atrium, I'm sorry. It comes into the right atrium. Then it drops down here. Then it gets it pumped up right. into the lungs. And then when it comes back, it comes down back into the left atrium. And then it drops down to the left ventricle. And then it's pumped throughout the body. It's oxygenated blood because it's coming from the lungs. Okay? Yeah. So this is just a holding area. This, the atrium is just a holding area. So it goes into the right atrium first. And the reason this is blue is because it's unoxygenated. It's purple. It's the color of your vest. Then it'll drop down in, in here, pump it up into the lungs where it becomes oxygenated. It'll drop back down into the left atrium, and then it drops into the left ventricle, and then it gets pumped throughout the body. And it feeds your, all of your cells the oxygen that it needs. That's the way it works, as much fun as that is. <clears throat> now the question is, how in the world does it keep from, I mean, mixing all this silly blood? Well, the reason is because there are, uh, uh, there are, are things that stop it, and I'm trying to think of a word for it. Uh, my dad had a couple of these things fixed. He, he had a, a heart uh, a valve, they were valves. He had a heart valve problem when he was born. Uh, so when he was, I don't know, he was in his 20s, he had to get it fixed because he couldn't join the army. It was a, it was a draft deferment. It was World War II. <coughs> and he, he wanted to go to war. What a goofball. He wanted to go to war. He had this perfect way of staying out of the army. He had this draft deferment. He was 4F. And he had two problems. He had a heart problem and he had um, hemorrhoids. So he had to get his heart fixed, and then he had his hemorrhoids fixed. Actually, they fixed them about the same time. So he, then he could join the army. That's how goofy the guy was. But uh, lived to be 90 years old with a, with heart problems. Uh, we've already I've already explained to you how all this stuff works. Systolic blood pressure is the lar the first larger number when reporting your blood pressure. Uh, your blood pressure 120 over 70 or whatever it is. So the systolic pressure is the largest number. Uh, it is the pressure represented when the blood leaves the left ventricle. That's when it's pumping all the pumping all the blood throughout your body. So that's the largest number. That's when your blood pressure is the highest. So the first number is the is the uh, most pressure that is against your your blood vessels. So it's 120, 140, 160, 180, 200. You know, it can be that high. If you have a, a if your blood pressure is high, then it's something over 120. Uh, 
Um, once upon a time, we used to say that 140 was okay when I was in the service. If you had 140 over 90, you're okay. You're, you're okay. Then they dropped it down to 130. They decided that 140 was too high. And if you had a 140, they needed to treat you and lower your blood pressure. So they dropped it down to 130. Now it's like 120. If you came into my emergency room and you had 110 over 60, we would have considered you having low blood pressure. We would have given you a medication to make it higher. But now they say that if you've got a 110 over something, that it's normal, as weird as that sounds. So everything has changed over time. We realized that, uh, that 140 was, way too, was a little bit too high, so we lowered it down to 130. Anyway, so blood pressure is kind of funny. A lot of people are taking blood pressure medication, including me. I had, had my heart attack, and now they treat me for high blood pressure. Uh, <laughs> Diastolic blood pressure is the lower, smaller number when reporting your blood pressure. This pressure represents the when the circulatory system is the most relaxed. So when we're talking about your blood pressure, we're talking about 140 over, well, when you're talking about my blood pressure, you're talking about 140 over 80, that's too high. My, my high number is too high, and my low number is also too high. So <clears throat> they try to lower my blood pressure to, to be more closer to normal. So it's usually one, uh, they want it to be 120 over 60 or something. 120 over 70. So the lower number is the most relaxed that the, the uh, blood pressure can be. Now the reality is that if your blood pressure is too high that uh, you'll, you're more likely to have a stroke. Doesn't mean you're going to have a stroke, just means that you're more likely to have a stroke. My mother lived with high blood pressure all of her life, lived to be 98 years old. What does that mean? Does that mean that I can do it? Probably not. She's, she's a female and I'm a male. There's a difference between males and females besides body parts. Do you have any health problems? Men have more health problems than women do. No, like you in general. <coughs> yeah. Oh, no. Jeez. No. No, I never get sick. What's wrong with me? There's something wrong with me. Maybe you'll live to 100. Maybe I'll live to be a... That's my plan. My plan is to make 130. God. I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. I just I need to do work it. it. I can do have it. <laughs> what I had for lunch? I had apples and I had a fruit cup and I had See, you uh, an energy bar. That's your snack. Yeah. That's oh. snack. Else. The major part of the respiratory system is the two massive lungs sitting behind your rib cage. <laughs> huge things there. Other parts of the respiratory system include your pharynx, uh, your trachea, your diaphragm, bronch bronchus, your alveoli, and your bronchioles. And of course this is what uh, gives uh, or takes in oxygen and distributes it, distributes it throughout your body. You already know how fast I could, could run when I was a baby, when I was in my 20s. <clears throat> Air, air enters the body through the nose or the mouth. The skin also breathes, but it is a, a minuscule amount. Uh, if you're not breathing from your lungs, you can actually survive taking in oxygen through your skin. Now, this is, I wouldn't advise it, uh, okay. but you can actually survive <laughs> taking in oxygen from your skin. Air passes through the pharynx, uh, that's the back of your throat, and into the lungs through the trachea, where food uh, goes into the digestive tract through the esophagus. Uh, air then passes into ever smaller structures, structures in the lungs, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. And of course, the <coughs> alveoli is where oxygen is transferred from the air into your blood. In the alveoli, oxygen from the air passes into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is released from the bloodstream into the ambient air. Uh, the process is reversed and the carbon dioxide is, is expelled from the body through the mouth and the nose. So if you're breathing, when you take, when you breathe in, you're taking in oxygen. When you breathe out, you're actually breathing out uh, carbon dioxide. So if I'm trying to breathe for somebody else, when I blow air into their, into their mouth or into their lungs, but it's got a lot more carbon dioxide than normal air has. 
So potentially I could strangle them to death just by breathing into their... I mean, I could, but... There is a, there's enough oxygen in the air that I'm breathing that, uh, that I wouldn't kill them. But potentially I could starve them for oxygen. Uh, it is a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood that triggers the diaphragm to con uh, contract, pulling air into the lungs. Uh, the darker your blood is, the more carbon dioxide you have in your blood. Now this can be a problem. People who smoke cigarettes don't, uh, for one thing, they cough a lot and they, when they breathe, they breathe far more shallowly than they should. So if you look at somebody who is a smoker, if you look at their blood, it's really, really dark, much darker than that. Uh, maroon color. Uh, so you can tell if somebody's a smoker. Actually, you can smell it in their blood, the nicotine. It's nasty. If somebody drinks, you can smell their blood and smell the alcohol on, in their blood. Isn't that weird? <laughs> but most people don't smell blood. But most people don't go around sniffing blood, right? Probably. But of course, that was my job, it wasn't sniffing blood, but being around blood all the time. So I got to see what it smelled like. And I could tell if somebody was a smoker for two, two reasons. I could look at their blood and see how dark it was. I could also smell, smell the tobacco in their blood. So as weird as that is. So if you went down to the emergency room and drew some blood from a guy that had been in the bar drinking and smoking, wow, his blood really smelled funky because he had both tobacco and, and alcohol in his blood. I knew a lady that could sniff somebody's blood <clears throat> and tell how much alcohol they actually had in, in their blood. That was her job. Her job was doing blood alcohols. So she would pop the cork and she would sniff it and then she would do the, the uh, test and uh, from that she figured out how to uh, calibrate how much alcohol they had in their blood by sniffing or sniffing their blood. This sounds all gross to you guys, but of course we were working in the lab, and we had to entertain ourselves one way or the other. So we did did we entertained ourselves by smelling things. Uh, okay, so what are we doing? The body is also able to clean dust and other foreign matter into the uh, front <laughs> matter in the air through sneezing when the toxins are too overpowering and coughing when the throat is irritated, and it's one of the reasons why we cough. So anytime you cough, coughing is a good thing. You need to cough as much as you feel like. Because there is a reason why you're coughing. Either you're coughing because you have a, a bacteria or virus in there that's irritating your throat, or there's dust in there that is irritating your throat, or potentially it's some other toxin. So go ahead and cough, and go ahead and spit out that mucus, because that mucus, <coughs> there you go. And spit out that mucus, because, see, I say cough, and he coughs. This is, you're such a good student. <laughs> go ahead and spit that stuff out if you want to, because that is the stuff that, you, uh, that uh, you've caught in your throat. And you need to get it out. You don't want it to go down into your lungs. Sometimes you cough, and if you chew on the mucus, see what's in there. Sometimes there's dirt in there and you can feel the granules of dirt. Try it sometime. So if we're smokers, do we have that constant nicotine in there? Yeah, they're, well, they have tar, there's tars. I, I don't know if you've ever, I used to, to do this with my students. Uh, if somebody was a smoker and they were outside smoking uh, when I was doing this lecture, I'd have them come inside and, you know, they'd be, they, I'd have them draw on their cigarette and then blow into a Kleenex, and you can see the yellow stuff. That's the tars from the cigarette. It was so cool. And of course, every time they were puffing on their cigarette, they're taking that stuff down into their lungs, all this nasty tars and stuff. And so I, I let my students see what it looks like. It's yellow. They know it's fun stuff. <clears throat> if you're a smoker. Uh, the entire air passage, the trachea, the nose, and the mouth are covered with tiny hair, hairs called cilia that trap foreign material like dust or germs and expels it, and will expel it from the body by coughing or swallowing the detritus coated in mucus. So whether you spit it out or whether you swallow it, it's still going to be killed in your stomach with all these uh, uh, 
acids in your stomach. We're trying to protect ourselves, okay? There's all these poisons wandering around trying to make us sick. Dust, all kinds of bugs in the, in the air, germs and viruses. The reality is that, you know, the coronavirus that everybody's so scared about, uh, the, the reason that it's so contagious is because we've never seen it before. But we've got all kinds of viruses. Uh, some, you know, Doris thinks she might have a cold, or you're getting over a cold, right? You're just getting your cold. Okay. So when she breathes in this room, potentially she is blowing all the rhinoviruses that are causing her cold out into the, into the air. Now here you are covering your nose. Don't worry about it. You're immune to that. You've had colds before. You don't have to worry about her cold. You're a healthy person. You're not going to catch a cold. I'm not going to catch a cold. I'm not going to get your cold, Doris. No matter how you try to contaminate me, I will not catch your cold. It's because our immune systems are fighting. He's so mean to you. There's something wrong with him. Uh, asthma is a chronic allergic reaction to allergens in the environment. And this is what happened to me a couple weeks ago. I didn't run this weekend. Normally I run on Friday and Saturday and Sunday in the morning, uh, but it was cold. The trail. The trail. Yeah, I run the trail. Mm -hmm. I run the trail. Washing like, dishes or cooking next to you, Rabbi. <laughs> With your dog. With my dog, that ugly little goofy dog. <laughs> Or I used to have two of them. Yeah, um, I used to have two of them. The other one's in Iowa now. The the pink one. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, he's he's not with me anymore. He's up in Iowa with my wife. Uh, he was such a sweet dog. He's is such a sweet dog. It's not like he's gone or something. <laughs> he's just not here. Anyway, okay. So the reason I didn't run this weekend is because I have a little cough. And I know what my cough is. It's bronchitis from the cold air that I breathed last weekend. It, it got, I, w I went out too early, and it was like, you know, 20, 19 degrees or 20 degrees or something. So I was breathing all this cold air in, and it irritated my lungs, and I got bronchitis. So what I got was cold air bronchitis. That's what I had. So I still have a little piece of it, but next, next weekend I'll be able to run. So there you, I'll be there with my, my silly looking dog. <laughs> uh, so that's what asthma is. But most asthma, about 90% of childhood asthma, is triggered by something in the air. Uh, so the kids become oversensitive uh, to animal dander, pollens, dust, indoor mold if, you, if they live inside and it's, it's damp in there, or damp conditions in a building. Uh, so they will, be, they will uh, become asthmatic because of these problems. Uh, Non-allergic asthma can be triggered by cold air, can be triggered by vir viral infections, can trigger them. Uh, secondhand smoke can cause uh, non-allergic asthma or household chemicals. Uh, so that's a, that can potentially be a problem. An asthma attack occurs when the body overreacts to an allergen by producing mast cells that constrict the airway. And this can be a really serious problem. They, they literally can't breathe because their bronchioles are clogged up, are closed, they're closed off. And of course, if we don't open these things up, they'll die. And this is why people die from, about 5,000 people die a year from asthma attacks. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they have to carry their puffer with them all the time. Depending on what uh, type of asthma they have, uh, potentially their puffer has uh, steroids in it, uh, or it has epinephrine in it, uh, so that it shocks their system into opening up their, their airways. Because if they start coughing and gagging, uh, they can die, and I've seen it over and over again. <clears throat> I had a friend, uh, this is in Omaha, uh, when I worked in Omaha. Uh, he was a respiratory therapist. His job was to save people's lives. His daughter had asthma, and one time she had an asthma attack, and he didn't get to her fast enough, and she died. And he was a respiratory therapist. He was a professional person to keep individuals from dying of asthma, and his daughter died of asthma anyway, despite the fact that he was a professional. 
The airway becomes inflamed and produces mucus to combat the inf inflammation. So it starts swelling up. And when something starts swelling up, uh, then it produces mucus in order to fight the infection, to fight the inflammation. This happens when you ca catch a cold. Normally, if you, what has happened is your mucous membrane has become infected. And your body overreacts to taking care of your problem. And that's why it takes you seven days to get over your cold. The reality is you probably eradicated the virus the first day. But your body is overreacting to it. And now you have to blow your nose for the next seven days. Because your body is producing all this mucus. Now what you really need to do is look at what color the mucus is. Because if you really have an infection, your mucus is going to be a select color. It'll be green or it'll be, it will be yellow or it may be white, but if it's clear, you don't have an infection, so you're okay, as long as it's not thick and green. If it's thick and green, you've got, you're, you've got an infection. You need to go see the doctor and get a, uh, some kind of a medication. Usually, uh, he probably will give you an antibiotic, but potentially what he should give you is an antiviral medication. That's one of the reasons why Zycan is, is, is uh, defeating colds all you need to do is take the Zycan. Zycan is an antiviral medication. So it will, it will stop your cold in, in about two days. Now if I have a reaction like this, if I have a viral infection, I know not to blow my nose. Because if I blow my nose, then I'm going to get, I'm going to have an overreaction. So I don't do it. And I don't get sick. Wah. But I hardly ever, this hardly ever happens to me. Uh, so, then, so what's happening is it becomes inflamed, it fills up with mucus to fight the inflammation. Uh, the symptoms of asthma include coughing, wheezing, whistling sound from the lungs, shortness of breath, and shallow breathing. And of course, this is as bad as it looks. As you can see, the airway is completely blocked. And this is what we don't want to do. That's why we need to shoot a uh, uh, puffer down into this guy's lungs uh, to uh, open it up. We need to open it up with a steroid, uh, which fights inf inflammation, or with epinephrine, which shocks the system into uh, opening up the airways. Okay. Asthma is, is the most common chronic uh, childhood illness. <coughs> it happens more with boys than girls, as weird as that is, even though boys have larger lungs than girls do. Girls are smaller than boys, so they tend to have smaller lungs than boys do. But we still have more boys with asthma. This may have something to do with your damn estrogen that protects you all the time, damn it. So you guys get estrogen and you get protected from all this crap and, and boys, they just keel over and die from it because, you know, what are we worth? Nothing. We're worth sperm, okay? What are they worth? They're worth babies, okay? I know, it's not fair. We're just not worth anything. 72% of boys have it, 11% of girls have it, 18% of children who grow up in poor families have it. Why? Because they're growing up in environments where there is more mold, there's more dust, there's more negative things. Lead in the paint of the walls. So poor families are more likely to have uh, uh, children with asthma than rich families. Uh, uh, only 13% of richer children have it. Uh, kids who live in in nicer homes and more uh, open homes. Uh, ch poor children live in, in smaller, smaller uh, uh, family structures, and for that reason they have more asthma. 21% of Hispanic and African American children have it, which doesn't seem fair, that's one out of every five. So if you, if you go to some place where there's a large, large number of Hispanics or a large number of African Americans, you're going to see one in five of the children out there will have asthma, as weird as that is. I used to live in uh, Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we did uh, educational research, and we were looking at uh, junior high schools. Uh, we were doing uh, drug education in uh, junior high schools. Uh, lots and lots of Hispanic kids. Lots and lots of kids with puffers, as weird as that is. 11% uh, of non-Hispanic white children have it, so if you're white, you're, does it mean that white people are immune to it? No, they live in larger houses, uh, there's uh, more air circulating through their houses, 
it's just a, a more a, a healthier environment. So that's one of the reasons. <laughs> there are 5,000 deaths per year due to asthma, though most are older adults who suffer an asthma attack. And of course, uh, since they've been using their puffer too much, now all of a sudden it doesn't work. Uh, one theory uh, as to why asthma is, is on the rise is because children are spending more time inside where they are exposed to household allergens, dust mites, animal dander, and cockroaches. Cockroach urine and co cockroach feces, which turns into dust, of course. So we're breathing in all of these horrible, horrible things. So if your house has uh, cockroaches, then you're more likely to have asthma, as god-awful as that sounds if you hate cockroaches, it's, and I know that's too much fun. Uh, anyway, there you go, allergens <laughs> and cockroaches. These are dust mites. That's what these are, dust mites. <laughs> so you'd think farmers would have a lot of asthma, but they don't, because they're outside all the time. Okay, just a thought. Uh, don't let your kid play video games because, by golly, if they're, if they're not going outside and playing, then they're probably going to be asthmatic. The more they stay inside, the worse it's going to be. So could an individual be cured of asthma? I'm sorry? Could an individual be cured? Usually they grow out of it when they get older. As they get older, their asthma goes away. As their lungs get larger. So, there you go. Uh, then they develop hay fever or, or something stupid. They become allergic to things. Uh, some individuals have uh, lots of aller uh, allergen or are, are allergic to a lot of things and other individuals aren't. My family has hardly any allergies. It's just your immune system. It's just the way your immune system works. Uh, you know, my, my family's aliens from another planet. Okay. <laughs> You've already figured that out, right? <laughs> Obviously. The digestive system is also known as the gastrointestinal system. What was I, I was watching a television show. Oh, they were saying that uh, people get all their allergies from Neanderthals. So, uh, if you go down to Africa, where they, they don't have any uh, Neanderthal ancestry in Africa now, uh, anybody that is, doesn't live in Africa has Neanderthal ancestry. But that's where we got our allergies, because the Neanderthals were in uh, Europe and the Middle East during the Ice Age. So it was cold and it was foggy, and so these people developed a different immune system. And so our allergies kind of come from our, from our Neanderthal ancestors. The digestive system is also known as the gastrointestinal system. Because of the necessity to keep all the cells of the body fed, the digestive system is the most complex system in your body, and it uses up a lot of energy. It represents a tube running from your mouth to your anus, and it runs for as much as 30 feet. And as you can see, it winds its way around. <laughs> it winds its way around, and it's 30 feet long. So you get all that, all that tubing uh, stuck in your gut. That's what your gut's all about. Uh, food starts off in the mouth where it is emulsified through chewing and, and a mixture of saliva from the salivary glands <coughs> to begin digestion. Uh, one enzyme in the saliva is amylase, which begins breaking down starches through decomposition. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why when you eat a donut or you eat uh, french fries, sometimes you get bad breath. And the reason is because it starts decomposing the uh, starch in your mouth. Uh, so if you've been eating potato chips, which is starchy food, sometimes it'll give you bad breath. It starts smelling like something's rotting in your teeth. The reason is because of the decomposition of the starches. It's breaking down the starches. Okay, so if you want to keep from having bad breath, don't eat starches because just don't eat starches. <laughs> Uh, when food from the mouth is swallowed, it passes through a muscular tube called the esophagus. Uh, food rarely gets stuck in your esophagus because of the power of the muscle and an involuntary reflexive motion downward called peristalsis. It's pulling the food down. Now this can be a problem if you, try, if you uh, somehow get uh, 
uh, too large a chunk of food and it goes down the wrong tube, now we got a problem because you can't breathe. That's when you have to do the Heimlich maneuver and try to pop that food out. Uh, one of the reasons it gets stuck is because this is such a muscular thing, so when, or the, the uh, muscular too. So when you swallow, it just pulls it down, and sometimes it can get jammed. Uh, and not in re really in your esophagus, but your air tube. Food influence can even get, uh, be consumed and swallowed while hanging upside down. And that's what these two young ladies are doing. They're eating while, being, while hanging upside down. You can do that. You can actually eat food in practically any position and swallow it down into your stomach. Even though your stomach is up and your mouth is down, <clears throat> you can still do that. In the stomach, the food is mixed with stomach juices to break down all the complex structures. Uh, hydraulic acid, hydrochloric acid, and pepsin uh, team up to break down complex proteins. Uh, gastric juices can be triggered by the sight of or smell of food and is one of the reasons for rumbling in the stomach when you encounter food. But you don't have to eat it, all you have to do is smell it or think that you're going to get it and all of a sudden your stomach will start growling. All you have to do is think about it and your stomach will start growling. The human stomach holds uh, two to four liters of food, that's uh, hamburger, french fries, and a coke. Good for you, hamburger, french fries. Just don't keep the uh, french fries in your mouth too long or you start getting bad breath. Uh, hyenas, on the other hand, uh, uh, have a stomach that can hold the equivalent of one third of their body weight. So we're not hyenas, we can't actually take in that much food. Unless you're a, one of those food, I don't know, they eat food, try to eat as much food as they can, as fast as they can, I don't know. It's some kind of a stupid game. They eat hot dogs. some goofy game. <clears throat> food slowly leaves the stomach. It doesn't stay in there forever. Uh, four hours after eating, the stomach is completely empty. <coughs> uh, so I ate lunch at uh, about uh, 12 o'clock. What time is it now? Uh, it's almost 4 o'clock. So yeah, it's, it's all the food's going out of my stomach. Actually, the food that I ate, I told you what I ate. So it wasn't very complex food. So probably it, it uh, emptied out in about two hours because it was all fruit and uh, a protein bar. It was, if it was a protein bar, it would have been, stayed in my stomach a little bit longer. But it was fairly uh, simple food, so it probably emptied out in about two hours. Uh, the stomach, stomach empties into the small intestine, and the small intestine empties into the large intestine. Digestive juices are added to the mixture in the small intestine to further break down the food from your pancreas, your liver, and your gallbladder. So if uh, I'm trying, if I'm eating a steak, uh, what happens is my gallbladder will, will squeeze uh, digestive juices into my stomach so that it can break down my steak. Uh, that's my gallbladder. If I don't have a gallbladder, I don't have that, those substances. So now I don't break down steak as well, <coughs> protein as well, as I did before, if, you're, if you've lost your gallbladder. You know, like how military, they go on missions and stuff like that, and just drop people out in the wild. And they have to, like, survive, and they say that their stomach kind of, like, shrinks. Sure. And then when they come back, they have, like, a whole buffet of food, but yet they don't want to eat. Because their stomach is so small. Yeah. 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 Haven't you ever not eaten anything for a couple days? And not really. The next... <laughs> All right. Okay, you've never been in the middle of the yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they're just mean to you and they don't let you eat, so that's, that's ugly. Yeah. The intestine is wound around the bottom of the thorax, uh, but if it were extended, it would be about 20 feet long with a total surface area of 3,229 square feet, uh, about the size of a basketball court. That's how much surface area, area you have in your, in your intestines. Inside the small intestines are tiny project, projections of mucus called villi, which uh, absorb water and nutrients. And of course, something can get stuck in these villi, and this can be a problem. Uh, and of course, then you have to go in there and, and clean that out. Otherwise, you've got all this pain for an extended length of time. Uh, the small intestine empties into the large intestine, also called the colon. Uh, any water that is still left in the food mass is absorbed in the colon. Uh, 
any food uh, that cannot be, if, if your colon spasms, that'll give you diarrhea. And this is usually what childhood diarrhea is caused by. So what we have to do, if somebody has diarrhea, <clears throat> we have to give them something to, to stop that spasming. And what we do is, uh, now we can give them Gatorade. Gatorade has electrolytes, and it will stop the spasming of their colon. So if you ever get a case of diarrhea, just uh, drink uh, Gatorade and clear water. And after about two doses of that, your diarrhea will be gone. I know. <clears throat> because the reason you have diarrhea is, is the spasming, and we have to stop the spasming. Uh, we've saved thousands and millions of, of lives around the world. Diarrhea used to be the number one killer of, of kids around the world. <clears throat> so what we have done is uh, now we have this protocol uh, to give them Gatorade, and we've actually saved millions of lives by uh, stopping the spasming. You can squirt yourself to death if you're not careful. If you have diarrhea for an extended length of time, if you can't stop that spasming, you're you're a dead dog. It just, uh, you're just not going to live for very long. Because you can get rid of lots and lots of water with diarrhea. And if you, so if you're squirting for an extended length of time, you're going to dehydrate and die. It's just the way it works. Let me tell you a diarrhea story. <laughs> <laughs> I was working in the hospital. We had oh, this little... I thought you were lying. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm really going to tell you a diarrhea story. Uh, I was working in the hospital and we had this little girl that came in and she had diarrhea. Uh, it was really bad. I mean, her, her stool was liquid. It was water. It was just plain water. Uh, so we couldn't figure out what was causing it. Lots of things can, co things can cause diarrhea. Uh, it can be bacteria. It can be a fungus. It can be, uh, it can be um, uh, a parasite. I mean, there's lots of things that can cause diarrhea. Dysentery, cholera, they all cause diarrhea. And the reason so many people die of dysentery and cholera is because it is diarrhea, and you squirt yourself to death. Literally, you dehydrate to the extent that you can't, you can't survive anymore. So we checked for salmonella. We checked for salmonella. We checked for shigella. We checked for E. coli, uh, which a lot of times, and they're all bacteria. And of course, we grew them on, on culture plates and, and we saw nothing. We didn't even see any normal flora. It was the weirdest thing in the world. So we looked for parasite. We looked in, in this lady's stool for this little girl. She was only about 12 years old. Uh, by this time, we've got uh, four IVs going. We've got one in each arm and one in each leg. Uh, that's, we're trying to pump fluids back into her system. And she's, it, it's not working. It's not working. We can't pump enough fluid into her body to keep her alive. And so she's real close, real, real, real close. And the doctor comes down, and, and I wasn't working in micro at the time, so, I, but I had looked at the, at the plates, and I saw that there was nothing growing. And he said, you know, she's, she's just a couple hours away from dying, and there's nothing we can do about it. So he said, is there anything that you can think of that would cause this kid to have diarrhea. Of course, he's a doctor. He's got all this information. I don't have any of this information. So I looked at her stool, and, and what I saw were what you would think you would see in somebody's stool who's really, really sick. It looked like white cells. And I said, you know, those are a little big for white cells. That might be something else. That might be yeast. So I, I took a specimen, and I put it in a germ tube, to grow yeast, and what it turned out to be was Candida albicans. She had a fungus. It was Candida albicans, the stuff that causes thrush. Now, normally, you don't get this stuff in your in your uh, intestines. You got it in your your intestines all the time, anyway. All five of us have Candida albicans in our in our intestines. The problem was that she, somebody had given her an antibiotic, and it had killed off all of her normal flora and her. The yeast had grown, had exploded, and it was irritating her bowels, and they couldn't stop it. This is before the protocol of the Gatorade. As a matter of fact, this is before Gatorade was invented. <clears throat> so we gave her a, a, a fla an anti-fungal uh, medication, Flagyl, we, and, it, and it cured her in like 30 minutes. I mean, it was a miracle. And this kid was 
you know, she was on death's door, literally. She was a mess. Uh, we saved her life. We were able to save her life. See, that's a diarrhea story. We st stopped her from screaming. <laughs> uh, so diarrhea causes fairly rapid uh, dehydration. Uh, having a couple squirts is not that big a deal, but if it uh, lasts for any length of time, for a day or two days, you need to, you need to make sure you get it stopped. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem, a real serious problem. Anyway, saved her life. It's my, one time I saved somebody's life. You can be a doctor. I'm sorry? You can be a doctor. I should have been, I should have yeah. been a doctor. No, this is the weird part. So the doctor gets written up in a journal because we had never seen this before. And so he gets written up. Does he, did he mention my name? No. no. Hell no. Hell no. No. And I'm the one that found it. He, he didn't even mention it. He didn't even have that on his mind. I was the one that found it. I'm a hero. I saved that little girl's life. Oh, well. It's not the first time I didn't get credit for doing what I did. Any bacteria, virus, parasite, fun, fungi, or a foreign micro, microorganism that can cause you harm is called an antigen. <clears throat> I was, uh, we were, <laughs> we went on a Fulbright trip to uh, South America and Central America. And when we were in Central America, we were the first American group to go in there after the Civil War. As stupid as that is. So here we are, I know, this is stupid. So here we are down in Guatemala City, and uh, everything cost like an arm and a leg. It was horrible. So we were complaining that it was, it was costing us too much money to eat. Uh, so they took us to this dive, this, uh, this little place out in the, out in the jungle. And uh, they fed us, uh, what did they feed us? Chicken, chicken and meatloaf, I think. So you had a choice between a vegetable plate, uh, chicken and meatloaf. And normally I would have had the meatloaf, but it didn't smell good. So I decided to eat the chicken. Well, they didn't cook their chicken very well. All of, everybody that had chicken got sick. And the reason we got sick is because we picked up a parasite. There was, they didn't cook the chicken enough. It didn't kill the parasite. And here we all came down with the same parasite. Ah, it was an antigen. <clears throat> it was a, a thing called cyclospora that they only have in Central America. Anyway, it almost killed us. It was terrible, terrible stuff. So we're talking about bacteria, viruses, parasites. In this case, it was a parasite. It was cyclospore. It was an amoeba. The immune system attempts to protect the body from antigens. Antigens can, antigens can invade the body through your skin, your digestive tract, your respiratory tract, or your urinary tract. So if you have sex with the wrong person, then potentially you're going, it's going, to, uh, you're going to get infected through your urinary. If you're breathing, you know, Doris's air, then all of a sudden we've all got Doris's virus, which we're not going to get because we're all <clears throat> too strong to get your, your problem. If you eat the wrong food like I did down in Guatemala, then you're going to come down with a parasite. And of course, if you have a sore on your skin, I've got a sore right here. Uh, if bacteria got into that, potentially I could get an infection. So why am I getting an infection? Because the antigens are invading my body. <clears throat> One major part of the immune system is the lymphatic system that is networked throughout the body. Uh, your lymph nodes, your uh, capillaries, your lymph ducts, bone marrow, spleen, thymus, and tonsils, these are all part of, of your immune system. This is your lymphatic system, as you can see. If you're a female, you have a uh, lymphatic system uh, in your armpits and, and on the outside of your breast tissue. If you're a male, you don't have the, these. Well, you don't have breasts for one of them. But you also don't have these nodes in your chest like uh, females do. Uh, why in the world would females have an extra uh, immune system? Why, why is the, your immune system more complex than the males? It's because you need to feed babies and you need to stay healthy. Remember the estrogen that keeps you from getting as sick as the guys get? <clears throat> this is one of the reasons your immune system is far more complex uh, than the male immune system. We're throwaway people and you guys are important people. So we're just throwaway people. I know, it's sad. Our immune system isn't as strong. 
they send us off to war and kill us off in the, in the dozens, they kill us off by masses, we're just not important people. So like, is a hermaphrodite more of a woman or a man? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Let's, t let's ask them and see if, if which, whether they're more male or female. The hermaphrodite, there's like you know, 15 in the whole world. Okay. So that's not an important question. Okay. But there's billions of men and there's billions of women. But the women are far more important than the men are. Because women represent babies. Men represent sperm. And that's it. That's all we represent. So our immune systems aren't as strong, we don't live as long. If you look at male cows, if you, or, or bulls, of course, if you look at male bovine, if you look, or if you look at male and female horses, if you look at male and female dogs, male and female cats, male and female bears, who lives longer, the male or the female? It's always the female, because she's worth more than the males are. The males kill each other, as stupid as that is. We fight over the females, and then we kill each other. Isn't that stupid? Females never fight each other. We're just dumb as dirt. <laughs> we're, we're, we don't exist. We're, we're, the only reason we're here is to impregnate the female. After that, we can just throw us out the window. It doesn't make any difference. Black widow spiders, uh, <laughs> praying mantises. So you can know. just a male old. Only with a sperm, that's it? That's it. That's all, that's all we're worth. Uh, but as you can see, the female lymphatic system is a lot, a much more complex. So if a female has breast cancer, one of the things that they will do is they will take out, they will not only take out the breast, which is cancerous, but they'll also take out the lymph nodes. And the reason they do is because uh, very often the cancer will, will get into the lymph nodes, and then they have to do a radical mastectomy with uh, lymphatic uh, Excision, you have to take out the lymphatic glands. Uh, the major instrument of the, the lymph uh, system are leukocytes called lymphocytes. And we talked about the lymphocytes before. They fight off viruses. What are the viruses? The viruses are what kill most people. Uh, so back in the day before we had antibiotics, uh, we did, what did we worry about? We worried about smallpox, measles, mumps, chickenpox. Uh, any of the viral infections. That's what killed everybody, the viral infections. So the, the uh, viral infections are far more virulent than just than any of the bacterial infections. Bubonic plague, of course, killed millions of people, but smallpox killed billions of people. Uh, when the Europeans first came over here with all their, their, their mixture of, of diseases, what killed all, almost everybody off, it was measles, mumps, and uh, smallpox. So that's what killed everybody <clears throat> because they're such virulent diseases. Lymphocytes are produced in the bone marrow and increase markedly whenever the individual encounters a viral uh, antigen. Uh, mononucleosis, uh, uh, the flu, is another viral infection. Walking pneumonia is caused by a virus. Measles, mumps, chicken pox, smallpox, which we have eradicated. Primarily, we've eradicated smallpox. It's one of the reasons why I'm the, I'm probably the only one in the room who's been vaccinated against smallpox. Do you have a smallpox vaccination? They, yeah, see, she's too young. That's irritating. To be so old that I've got a smallpox vaccination. Do you get a vaccination once, just once? Uh, I was vaccinated five times, and the reason I was vaccinated five times was because I was in the military. And uh, I was vaccinated uh, when I was five years old. I was vaccinated when I went away to college. That's twice. Uh, I was vaccinated every time I went overseas against smallpox. But then again, I was going into an area that the people weren't vaccinated against smallpox. So, do you, I, do you still get vaccinated? No. 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 I don't. Did you? I don't. I, I don't ever get it, but. No, you, they would never vaccinate you for smallpox. Oh, I thought you meant just in general. Just vaccine. in general. In 1969, my daughter was vaccinated against smallpox. I think uh, they are uh, with our immunization. I think we are protected. Against smallpox? Yeah. No, you're not. They don't, they don't do that anymore. They've almost eradicated smallpox. You don't need to be vaccinated. 
uh, and they, they eradicated it in the, 19th, the late 1960s. My daughter was vaccinated against smallpox, and my son wasn't. She was born in 69, and my son was born in 72. And by 1972, they stopped vaccinating against I, smallpox. I got chicken pox when I was like seven or eight years old. Yeah. They, so now they... Got that big. And now they vaccinate against chicken pox. But back in the day, they didn't have a vaccination against chicken pox. Uh, okay, so remember you were telling me that it can come back just like a shingles? Yeah. So I got, I got my, shot, my shingles up oh, geez. on Thursday. Oh, did so, you? Yeah. How, how's your shoulder? Uh, it's okay. We got used to shots. See, I got that shingle shot. I almost said damn shingle shot. I got that shingle shot, and, and it bothered my, my uh, shoulder. So I now I can't. I can't lift. I was told to move around, so I was doing that. Oh, I tried that. It didn't work. I did yeah. push-ups after, after I got my shot. Ah, so I'm not getting the second one. You're supposed so to. I was told to come back get the my second. Right. If it didn't, if the first years. one didn't bother you. Go ahead and get that shingle shot. Until nine years, I'm gonna get another one. Plus, it, it depends on uh, maybe like technology or something. Nine years, I might get only one shot. But uh, I was told after, like, maybe in April, I'm going to get a booster shot. Now, you had your shingle shot, and they only gave you one shot. Yeah, I'm going to go back over there in April to get a booster shot. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. See, they have two shingle. There's two shingle shots. Oh. Uh, the first shingle shot uh, was the first uh, vaccination that they had against the shingles, and it was only 30% effective, but it was only one shot. Then they came up with this other shingle shot. That's what you have. And you have to have two of them in order for them to work. You have to get, get one, and then later you have to get the booster in two months. Okay. Yeah. So you got the second shot. It's 70% effective. Okay. And then after that, we, I'm going to go back to get another shot until nine years. Yeah, yeah you'll have to get a booster shot after that. <clears throat> okay, so the reason we have all this... <laughs> these lymphocytes is to fight all of these viral infections that can cause lots and lots of problems. Lymph is uh, colorless fluid that circulates throughout the lymphatic system, picking up debris in the form of bacteria and viruses. It's one of the reasons if you get an infection, then all of a sudden your lymph nodes will swell up. You get the mumps and all of a sudden you got this big chunk of, of meat right here because that's your lymph nodes swelling up. You, get, uh, you cut your, your leg, uh, you got an infection, it's, it's pus is coming out of it, all of a sudden the, you get a, uh, your lymph nodes in your groin will swell up. So you get this lump in your, in your groin. And it will stay there until, until the, the infection goes away. So that's what happens. That's why you get these lumps all over your body if you get an infection. Lymph is filtered through areas of concentration uh, called nodes where lymphocytes uh, gather to kill the invaders. The nodes can swell and inflame if the infection is too severe, and these are known as sw swollen lymph nodes. So if, when you were a child, if you had tonsillitis, the, it was probably because of the uh, of, of a cold or of uh, you know, strep throat, uh, you'll get tonsillitis after that. And that's because your, your tonsils are lymph nodes. You have lymph nodes right there in your tonsils. And so uh, the reason that you have tonsils as a child is so you can fight off all the childhood illnesses. Once upon a time, the kids would have their tonsils taken out when they were 10 or 11 years old. And the reason is because they had already been through all the childhood illnesses. Measles, mumps, chickenpox. They had already been through them all. So once all the childhood illnesses were, were over with, they could have their tonsils taken out. As weird as that is. Okay. Is that exciting? But now we inoculate you against all of those things. So you don't have childhood illnesses. So we don't have nearly the tonsillitis we did in the old days. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, everybody had their tonsils taken out. Because everybody came down with mumps, measles, and chicken pox at some point. There's five childhood illnesses. And the fifth one is known as fifth disease because it's a fifth childhood illness. Well, I came down with fifth disease when I was in the service, when I was in the Air Force. And it got so much fun that they thought I had syphilis. <laughs> and I had fifth disease. <laughs> 
I was 22 years old. I was not supposed to get a childhood illness. So they assumed it was syphilis instead of Okay, we need to stop right now. I didn't have syphilis, okay? <laughs> Even though those jerks thought I had it. Then they thought I had salicylate poison.